while this loads, has anybody ever played around with any sort of direction finding? I hear that some of you may have done a little bit. What sort of techniques have you used, if you can tell us? Right, so you've done some fox hunting. All right, so I call this Duff Duff. Well, usually you may have heard of uh, Huff Duff for HF, but um, I call it uh, Duff Duff. So at least you'll know now. Um, obviously, you probably know that um, it's used for signals intelligence, emergency aid, tracking, uh, and has just been mentioned for sport as well. Uh, it was used in especially World War II by the British to track U-boats in the Atlantic using uh, the U-ADCOC uh, antenna setup. Uh, and it's currently used today as well. You have some enormous installations that currently still exist. This one is in Germany, for example. Uh, and speaking of the Germans again, this one is crazy serious about uh, the fox hunt, holding a Yagi here that can uh, obviously be used to find, I guess, whatever they're trying to find. Um, but one approach, there are all sorts of different approaches that you can use. I went for the pseudo-Doppler because it's relatively simple. There are much more sophisticated techniques um, that, that can be used, but this is, this is good with one particular, uh, one radio, one simple radio. Uh, but what we want to do is, is exploit the Doppler shift um, of radio waves caused by actually moving an antenna about or simulating the movement of an antenna. And we measured this shift to determine the direction in which that uh, radio transmission is coming from. So obviously, just to recap, you know that when an object moves and it's emitting uh, waves, they will get compressed or expanded depending on uh, where you are with respect to the, the thing. Um, the o most common example that people refer to is when you have an ambulance or a police siren uh, driving by. But I thought this was quite interesting because they say that the, the pitch of the, um, the, the frequency increases or decreases as it passes by you. And this is actually uh, erroneous because if you think about it, as it's coming toward you or, or moving away, the, the pitch, although it will be different, should remain constant. It's just that the higher sound pressure level actually changes the perceived pitch, which is due to the way our ear works. So that's something to bear in mind. Uh, obviously, this is quite different from uh, radio waves or audio, but it's visualized quite nicely here in the, um, in the pond. And uh, this is also the basis, of course, for the um, cosmological redshift in terms of the expansion of space. So it's, it's pretty cool when you think about all the uh, places that it applies. But let's think about RF now. If we have my high-tech radio wave here passing through this, um, this circle, we have this antenna that will be swung around this circle. And so what you can imagine is that as it moves in the arc uh, from A through B to C, it'll be moving into the wave and then you actually will encounter a Doppler shift, which looks amazingly to be the uh, top half of a single cycle of a sine wave. And then when you come through the remainder of the circle, you'll be moving in the opposite direction and the Doppler shift will in fact move the other way. Uh, and then you get the, the bottom uh, side of that. And so what you're actually doing is in terms of the radio, remember the radio connects, one radio connects to the single antenna that's moving in this circle. Uh, that um, Doppler, phenomenon will affect the signal that actually arrives at the radio. Now the cool thing is that if you use FM, what you're doing is you're inducing an additional tone onto your uh, demodulated audio. This is great for narrow band FM. And if you think about what's going on, FM usually just obviously shifts that center frequency around based upon your modulated signal. But when you're using the Doppler shift, you're actually doing a, a little bit more and um, that sine wave then gets put onto the uh, original signal and then when you demodulate it, you essentially just get a single tone out. And what's interesting about that is the phase of that tone and that will reveal uh, where your uh, transmitter actually is. So if you consider this again in the circle, uh, if you were to have even more points in your circle and then graph out the uh, actual Doppler sine wave, then depending on the direction of the signal, you would in fact get your sine wave here, it's shifted slightly, so it, it's coming from a different um, direction. Now the issue of course is that if you just were to actually physically, mechanically rotate that antenna, then you need to take all these things into account, but to do it at some decent frequency, then you would need to rotate the antenna very, very fast. Obviously this is practically impossible, uh, so what's the workaround? 
you use a fixed array of multiple antennas and you electronically switch between them. So again, you would have your setup and you would get a, a, some sort of antenna switch to actually go around uh, each of the antennas and then the output from that switch connects into your radio once again. Now, back to this diagram, here you're not actually moving anymore your antenna through uh, the, the wave, which is why it's not really proper Doppler, it's now pseudo Doppler. And so when you actually switch from A to B to C, then you'll get this pulse and then when you come back the other way, you'll get the pulse in the other direction. And so if you filter this and smooth it out, you end up getting that same sine wave. Uh, this is sort of your classic RDF box that you might have seen in cars. You have the ring of LEDs and one will illuminate uh, in the direction that you should be heading. But um, if you look at the internals, you have your, your clock that synchronizes the uh, antenna control as well. You have your audio digital filter that narrows in on that single tone because you want to connect this to any old FM radio but you want to ignore obviously all of the other frequency components and just focus on that one Doppler frequency. Uh, obviously there's a bit of hardware involved but we like software so you can put an antenna array on your roof obviously. So I tried to do it with software. Uh, again this is the uh, USOT1, an antenna switch and what I've called the Duffmobile with my sort of home antenna array on the roof using suction caps. So this is all uh, done in software now. That's all done in software. Um, these are just suction caps and I've cut out some um, metal and stuck some uh, wire on the end of it. Equal length leads obviously going down into the antenna switch. This was um, a, a, a little uh, dev part uh, that it just simply hooks up. Now this this is the cool part though. Um, here you have the WBX daughter board and you have the GPIO pins coming off the grand order board. And the, the trick is to actually use the clock, the FPGA clock, to control the antenna switch. And so what you do is uh, I modified the uh, FPGA code to actually take certain bits of the sample counter that started when you begin streaming from the device and map them to the pins, actually all of the top row of pins on this pin header. And so I've just got my little DSO Nano hooked up and you can actually see the, um, the waves coming through. Now there are, on that switch, there are four um, points that you need to switch through so you only need two bits. Um, now this is nice because it means that on the host side, it's actually operating in the same clock domain. So everything is operating from the FPGA clock. And it means that the reference sine wave that you produce on the host will actually be synchronized to the sine wave coming from the device. Because obviously your samples are coming in and the sample counts are actually going uh, based upon the samples that are received by the host and GNU radio. So um, the other neat thing as well is that because every time you start streaming from the device, the sample counter starts at zero, it means that you only have to calibrate your antenna array orientation just once. So obviously, when you set it up, you don't necessarily know whether um, you need to add or subtract 90 degrees or 180 degrees and so on. If you do that once uh, and you remember that offset, then that's it. It'll always uh, start from the same point when you begin streaming. Um, so again, this is the uh, the fat power supply that I added after, unfortunately, had a mishap with that regulator, but it's got the cool heatsink, uh, and these are the four points going into the antenna switch. You can see the uh, control cable going back around into the WBX, uh, and this is the mo more recent uh, run. So I've got the laptop uh, at the rear here actually running GNU Radio. Uh, it's running uh, the demodulator and, and analysis of that Doppler tone, and that feeds into this uh, mapping application that's also hooked to, into the GPS. Unfortunately, you didn't get a good screenshot of this, but the interesting thing is that here ordinarily would be a um, very distinct narrowband signal. Once you actually engage the, the antenna switch, then it actually um, affects the, the spectrum quite greatly and pushes everything out and you get these multiple peaks. Um, so this is actually the flow graph. Um, this, is, this is actually one of the, the more neater ones that I've created. I'll, I'll run through this very quickly so you get an idea of what's going on. You've got the USRP source there, quadrature new modulator, uh, the band pass filter narrow in on the tone and then you got all this uh, jazz down the bottom to actually calculate the uh, the phases and then and then do the comparison. Um, the salient points are that uh, I moved the um, the uh, baseband. Obviously, you don't want to be around the uh, the LO to get a good um, signal, so use the translating FIR filter there. Um, the other thing is it, that's 
quite brilliant um, about the way GRC works is that you know you can put in the the raw Python expressions to evaluate things, and you don't actually need to do much calculation on paper. You can just get it to do it, update a single variable, and it'll figure the rest out. So all you need to know is the the FPGA clock rate, your decimation. Here it was these values. Um, I used the 31st and 32nd bits of that sample counter um, that are output through the pin header. And then if you actually calculate uh, that out, then you get the value of the tone that you want to listen for. And that's all done programmatically in, in GRC. Uh, and then once you know your translation decimation is five, and I have this many FFT bins, then you can calculate that, add that out, and then it will focus in exactly on the 160th bin of the FFT. Uh, so the bandpass filter does the filtering. Now, remember I was talking about that reference sine wave, that's just produced by the, the signal source. Because of the nature of the flow graph, it will request samples from here at the same rate as they are coming in from your USRP. And um, here, we look at one side, so this is actually the, uh, the Doppler tone coming in. Um, we, I beg your pardon, Let, let's look at this one. So the signal source, it, it works both ways around, but we turn it into a vector so that we can take the FFT, uh, and then a couple of things happen here. Firstly, we do vector to stream and then we skip 160 samples. So what we've done is we've actually skipped up to the 160th bin, which is the one we're interested in, right? And then we keep one in N, we keep one in 1024 after that. So what this will do is it'll only keep each subsequent 160th bin. And that is used then to, you can calculate the, uh, the argument to find a phase. Uh, the magnitude to find the, the strength in that bin. Um, here also, this one skips uh, none and just does keep one in 1024 because that's looking at the DC component, which I found uh, actually gives you a, a little bit of a hint as to the quality of your signal. So that's done on both the reference and the input. And then you can take the arguments and both subtract them, and then you're done. This takes into account the strength, the uh, phase, um, the DC and uh, I can't remember what the fourth one was, but it puts them into a UDP sync and sends it through to the mapping application. So this is actually the D mod. You can see just under eight kilohertz there, that Doppler tone. Um, this was a little test app I did just to make sure that it, the um, that FFT comparison would work. And it was you know good to actually go out and test it out. So we picked a big transmitter, looked up the frequency of one of the transmitters, actually a control channel, so it was running all of the time, and then started driving around a little bit. And every time you sort of pull up to the curb and you need to be safe, obviously, um, make a direction measurement. And then eventually things sort of start to line up around that red X, which uh, was where the transmitter was located. One interesting thing was that, uh, around this area, I was actually descending into, I guess, a valley down from a hill. and. I no longer had line of sight of the transmitter, and in fact, the waves were passing off the top, hitting the back um, of that valley, and as I was driving down through up the next hill, the entire time, my laptop was saying uh, south, because instead of having to look at it, it actually speaks out the direction. Um, so the, the array was detecting the, the wave front coming from actually behind me, and then as soon as I came over the hill, it uh, resumed to saying north again. So that was a really good example of um, RF reflections. Uh, in addition, when you're moving around, most of the time it sounds like crap. I have it plugged into the car audio system. And um, that's why it's good to set these thresholds. So this is the, the strength of the Doppler tone, uh, the DC uh, strength in the, in the DC bin. Uh, and then when you sort of hear it clear up, when it comes to a still, you, or you sort of inch forward until you hear it clear up, and then you take your measurement. Otherwise, the rest of the time, it's just it's actually a little bit all over the place. Uh, and then eventually, you know, uh, you sort of get around the right spot. The next step, obviously, is to have it do it automatically. Uh, but this is the uh, the latest setup. Uh, last Friday, I went for a drive around Mountain View. Um, you can see here, this is um, sort of Mountain View, if you're familiar with the area. Uh, Google's up here. And it was actually quite cool. Uh, I didn't actually realize this was Google that I was driving into. I only realized when I saw the, the multicolored bikes. And um, I felt, well, finally, this was good because they get to drive around everywhere with cars with all sorts of interesting things on the roof, like LiDAR and, and um, Street View. And finally, I was driving into their campus with something interesting on my roof as well. And you do get a lot of interesting looks and questions. And if you're going to do this, something to bear in mind, uh, it's always good to have the cars rego paper. 
Um, it's always good uh, if you have a ham license to actually have the papers with you as well, just in case. Um, it's always also good to have structural redundancy so that if, if something happens to pop off, then this very uh, makeshift string here will keep everything tied down. And, and this has actually helped in the past, believe it or not. Um, you know, look clean shaven, respectable. And if you have any Motorola XTS radios, do hide them because often they don't realize that they can be used as legitimate uh, radios by hams. And um, the issue with, with the previous car was that I didn't have a sunroof, so the cables came down through open windows and I couldn't open the doors, therefore, because it was all tighter in, in the back. So to get out of the car, I had to climb out the window and if the police come and they ask you to get out of the car, it's going to look a bit awkward sort of you know, getting out and you'd have to turn around and disconnect the cables and they, they might get suspicious as well. So anyway, things to bear in mind. Uh, yeah, so Duff Duff. And just in the last remaining minute, uh, I might quickly show you a video. Any, any questions in the meantime while I bring this video up? No? This one should load without a hitch. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> let's say let's say paranoid. The uh, sorry, the question was um, the checklist was that from um, experience, lessons learned, or or just paranoia? Um, it was more lessons learned from from other people. So, uh, could I have a bit of audio on this, if possible? I've plugged it in and the audio is right up. I just Can you hear that? Northeast. Northeast. Is that coming through at all? East. You can hear it saying east, northeast. Uh, and I'm sort of driving up and you, that black I don't know. I should motion stabilize this but you can see that black line east sort of northeast. pointing around about the direction um, that you saw on the map, the map before. And interestingly, uh, I figured that at about 45 miles an hour, that's South when southwest. the wind really starts to cause the, uh, the, the plates, the, the ground plane on the southeast. antennas to resonate. And uh, it sounds very disconcerting when that happens, so I, I might try and go for a little bit more uh, redundancy, structural redundancy or, or a better setup next time. But um, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.